Have you ever been hungry? And I don't mean just needing a little bite to eat. I mean hungry. Have you ever been so hungry that your head ached and you were nauseated and, and dizzy? Have you ever been hungry? Have you ever been so hungry that you had a knot in the pit of your stomach and your hands were shaking and your body was trembling? Have you ever been hungry? I don't mean that you just have a taste for something. I don't mean the kind of hunger that causes you to seek out certain things like Harold's Chicken or a Taco Bell or, or your favorite barbecue joint. I mean hungry. Have you ever been really hungry? Hungry enough to eat just about anything. Hungry enough that a cracker would do. Hungry enough that a mayonnaise or ketchup or butter sandwich would be enough. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about this morning. Hungry enough that something out of the garbage can do. Have you ever been hungry? Famished? There are people in this world today who are beyond hunger. Uh, they have reached the point of starvation. Statistics tell us that 48.1 million Americans lived in food insecure households, including 32.8 million adults and 15.3 million children. 14% of households were food insecure. 6% of households experienced very low food security. Households with children reported food insecurity at a significantly higher rate than those without children. Households that had higher rates of food insecurity than the national average included households with children, especially households with children headed by single women or single men, black, non-Hispanic households and Hispanic households. Statistics say a number of years ago that 5.4 million seniors or, or uh, over the age of 60 or 9% of all seniors were food insecure. Food insecurity exists in every county in the United States, ranging from a low of 4% in Slope County, North Dakota, to a high of 33% in Humphreys County, Mississippi. And if we look at worldwide trends, we see that some uh, 795 million people in the world do not have enough food to lead a healthy, active life. That's about one in nine people on Earth. The vast majority of the world's hungry people live in developing countries where 12.9% of the population is undernourished. Asia is the continent with the most hungry people, two-thirds of the total. Sub-Saharan Africa is the region with the highest prevalence of hunger. One person in four there is undernourished. Poor nutrition causes nearly half of deaths in children under five. 3.1 million children each year die of poor nutrition. One out of six children, roughly 100 million in developing countries is underweight. One in four of the world's children are stunted. In developing countries, the proportion can rise to one in three. They are so desperate that anything will do. That is why our feeding ministry is so important. And if you care at all, I urge you to help and support this ministry both with your time and with your finances. The least we can do to make a difference in the world is to reach out and meet the needs of our own community. For there are people all around us that are hungry. Have you ever been have you ever been famished? You know, our gospel today tells us that after Jesus had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, he had eaten nothing and he was famished. My dictionary tells me that famished means that someone is so hungry that they are starving and at the point of death. Jesus 
was at the point of death. Our bodies can survive for an average of 30 days without food, and Jesus had gone well beyond that point. Jesus was famished, and in his time of extreme hunger, the devil came to him and tempted him as he began the long and lonely journey to Calvary and the cross. I have to stop here and wonder, beloved, why it is that temptation, the devil, evil, why is it that they come to us at our weakest hour? Temptation comes to us in our most vulnerable circumstance. When we are desperate, it seems that we will do almost anything to relieve our suffering. We'll accept anything. We'll bargain for anything. We'll hustle for anything just to make it. Just when we were getting uh, low on our money, went to the grocery store, the clerk's going to give you too much change. Uh, just when we are in the depths of our despair and hopelessness, there's that, that bottle speaking to us and calling our name. Temptation, the devil, comes to us at opportune times when our resistance is lowest and our resolve has left us. And we end up making decisions and choosing avenues that we regret. The problem with evil is not simply that it causes trouble in our lives, but that often the trouble erupts in our times of greatest weakness. Evil and temptation like to kick us when we're down. And we must understand that the narrative in this gospel of Luke chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, our gospel text today, connects Jesus with the historical experience of Israel in the wilderness. And thereby, I believe, connects Jesus to our experience as God's imperfect people in this wilderness of life. And if we are honest with ourselves as individuals and as a people on this day, specifically as those described by the Reverend Courtright Davis as endowed by ebony grace, our journey has been filled with failed faithfulness and drunkenness with the world's wine. And in our low points, temptation has gotten hold of us. We even bow to the evil temptation to sell our own people into the hands of the oppressor, all for a few coins. We bow every day, some of us, to the temptation of profit over people when we continue to deal drugs in our neighborhoods. We enslave our people again and again when we bow to the temptation of political power over the good of the community. We allow the devil to use us when we allow our children to believe that being smart is not cool and listening to music that degrades our people and touts against the lifestyle is okay. That is why James Weldon Johnson prayed, lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. The children of Israel, if you remember, forgot God in their time of weakness. And they forgot God in their time of temptation. Since the Israelites were so hungry, they even wanted to go back to their slavery. Pharaoh, if you remember, caught up with the Israelites on their journey at a very vulnerable moment in an effort to recapture them. Now, they were at the banks of the Red Sea and surrounded by mountains. And it seemed they had no place to run. What we must understand, beloved, is that when we are trying to go forward or do something worthwhile, expect that what you are trying to outgrow or get away from, expect it to come after you in your vulnerable moments and tempt you to do some foolish things. Pharaohs never cease trying to recapture their slaves. Whether Pharaoh is called racism, whether Pharaoh is an abusive past, whether it's guilt or fear or lying or, or alcohol or drug abuse or even overeating, Pharaohs always look for a vulnerable moment to recapture slaves. 
And then on our wilderness journey, on our long journey, we can expect some shortages. We can expect shortages of money and faith and patience and endurance. Not only did the children of Israel have shortage, they ran out of some things. Not only did they run out of bread, they came to places where the water was bitter, where there was no water at all. On our journey, beloved, through life's wilderness to, and to any place worthwhile, expect some bitter disappointments and bitter discouragement that will tempt you to give up on God. Sometimes people will present things to you that you just can't swallow. And at other times, you will find yourself in a place of drought. The devil will say, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And what will you do? The devil will lead you up and show you all the kingdoms of the world and say that, that if you but sell out, these can be yours. If you give up your integrity, this power belongs to you. What will you do? then we will pray and receive no immediate word from the Lord, no sign from the Spirit, no clue as to what we should do, no inspiration to keep us going, no hiding place from the pressure, just barrenness on the horizon and emptiness in our soul. Expect the drought that drains where everything is going out and nothing seems to be coming in. You're walking through the wilderness of life. The time will come when you are at your lowest point and temptation will dangle before you a poisonous apple. What will you do? What will you do? The time will come when you have no fight left in you. The time will come when you are at the end of your rope. The time will come when your character as a child of God will be tested against the needs and wants of your flesh. And what will you do? Perhaps the better question is, what did you do when it happened to you? There's a story of a man who reported his observations of the effects of a hurricane on a southeastern Gulf Coast town. And as he walked up and down the ravaged streets, he observed that the palm trees had been uprooted and just flung about. Once tall and majestic, their root systems were too shallow to withstand the hurricane force wind. But as he proceeded, he came upon a lone oak tree. The leaves had been blown away, and some of the smaller branches had been ripped off, but the roots had gone deep, and the tree held its position. And in due season, it would produce leaves once again. And beloved, so it is with us. If we are to endure the hurricanes, if we are to endure in times of great stress and difficulty, we must beforehand have put down some deep roots. And it is Jesus who shows us how. Jesus is our connection. Jesus is our example here of how to make it on the long and difficult journey through the wilderness in our times of weakness, in our times of famishment, if you will, without yielding to the temptation of evil. And, and I love this account in the Gospel of Luke because it reminds me of a mental tennis match. Uh, Jesus and the devil going back and forth, back and forth. But Jesus had the roots to withstand the assault because his soul was anchored in God's word. And sometimes, beloved, we are unable to endure because God's word is not hidden in our hearts. We are empty. We can't call upon anything for strength because there ain't nothing there. We can't call upon the word in times of adversity. The antidote that Jesus used in, 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 in resisting temptation was a profound understanding of Scripture. In each of his answers, he appeals to a passage of the Scripture. He says, it is written, 
one does not live by bread alone. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. We cannot afford to be without God's word because it is by God's word in our time of temptation that we are able to make it through. The antidote for contemporary folk like us those of us who claim to be believers is a deeper immersion in the scriptures. Time will come when the devil tries to turn us around and mix us up in our time of weakness. But all we need to do is pick up our compass, which is the word of God. That's what our ancestors did. As they traveled through the wilderness of slavery and segregation, they picked up the word of God. And when Satan told them to hate, the Bible told them to love their enemies. When Satan told them that they would forever be enslaved, Bible told them that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. When Satan told them that they were less than, the Bible told them that they were the apple of God's eye. That is why we must know the word. Yes. First century Jews knew the power of words. Words were not simply sounds in the air, but they were units of energy. They were power in and of themselves. A word not only said things, but it did things. Thus, when we read the account of, of the creation in, in Genesis, yes. God speaks and things happen. Over and over and over again, we read, and God said, and in response to what God said, light was created, and, and water was gathered, and earth was sculpted, and stars were hung, and birds were flying, and animals roamed, and human beings were formed in the image and likeness of God. God's word is powerful. Amen. And in order to resist temptation, I submit this morning to do and be wrong, we must know God's word. Now I declare to you, my dear brothers and sisters, that the time will come when you will need the word. But glory be to God, we have a living word in Jesus Christ, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. Now this is why the power of Christ as the word of God is always able to conquer the works of evil. Jesus as the word of God in action. He's the word of God in action. As the word of God in action, he has a message to communicate to us in our times of extreme hunger and famishment, which can feed us and make us full and strong and alive. And we must eat of it. We must fill ourselves with it. If you're divorced like a woman at the well, Jesus has a word of restoration. Uh, if you've been caught in sin, Jesus has a word of forgiveness. If you're bound like one demon possessed, Jesus has a word of deliverance. If you're mourning like Martha and Mary, Jesus has a word of hope and resurrection. If you've given your all like the widow and her two coins, Jesus has a word of affirmation and support. If you're old like Nicodemus, Jesus is a word about a second birth. If you've denied him like Peter did, Jesus is a word about second chances. If you're young like the boy with loaves and fish, I feel like preaching this morning. Jesus has a message about using what you have and stop complaining about what you don't have. Oh, if you've been hung up to die like a thief on the cross, Jesus has a word of salvation. Whoever you are, and in whatever situation you find yourself in 2019, Jesus has a word for you. That is why, especially during this season of Lent, and in every season, I challenge you, I double dog dare you, to read God's word. Because, beloved, the time will come. The time will come when that great professor of the universe will give you your final test your final exam. And the ultimate existential question is, will you pass it or will you fail it? Amen. Amen.